So after watching these video lectures, students will be able to write generic rate laws and calculate uh, rate laws for specific reactions from data provided. Um, students will also be determined, able to determine uh, rate law orders um, with respect to the overall order as well as for specific uh, reactants. And students will be able to calculate the rate constants for specific reactions. So before we get into the um, nitty gritty details of the rate laws and how we um, establish the various components, I first want to discuss um, the reversibility of reactions. Um, so if we look at the uh, reaction example here, we basically have NO2 um, decomposing into NO and O2. Okay, and this would be looked at as our forward reaction. Okay, so basically our reactants going to products. Um, however, the reality of reactions is that there are actually two processes occurring at the same time. So there is this forward reaction um, in which the decomposition is occurring. Um, but there is also the reverse reaction which is occurring at the same time. Okay, so this process or this reaction um, actually has a reversible component to it. Okay, um, and we'll discuss this a little more um, in our next unit, but basically when you read it, reach the point at which the forward reaction rate and the reverse reaction rate are the same, um, there's not going to be a net change in the concentration of reactants or products. So basically overall, um, the concentration of reactants and products will remain constant. Um, and this is called chemical equilibrium. Um, because this fact exists, um, we have to make a few um, assumptions and we have to make... Uh, a few um, points of observation um, in our rate law determination. Okay, so um, basically what that means is that when we're looking at writing rate laws and things of that sort, uh, we're going to usually study our reactions very soon um, after reactants are added together. And the reason why is because at that point we know that in the whole entire situation the reverse reaction is less likely to make any contribution. So um, most of the studies that we're doing in terms of establishing rates um, and basically how we go about uh, figuring that out uh, will deal with the reactants being mixed um, and basically the soon after analyses of concentrations and things of that sort. So now that we've discussed the reversibility of the reactants, let's go ahead and move on to what we're actually trying to cover for this lecture. So general rate laws are going to be determined or dependent only upon the concentration of our reactants. Now the reason why we are able to make this assumption is because we analyze our rates um, at the very start of a reaction progression. Okay, so basically when there's only um, A and B or reactant present. Um, so if we look at the reaction very early on, what ends up happening is we have mostly A and B and little to no uh, C and D. So the reversible process um, that is present and that we will consider later when we move on to our next unit, um, that will be being ignored because it's not really present in a, in a very large quantity. Now our general rate law is going to be equal to a constant times the concentration of our reactants that are involved in uh, the rate determining process for the specific reaction we're looking at. Um, and each of those will be to some power. Now, the rate constant is going to be specific to the rate of the reaction you're looking at, um, and we'll have different units and such depending on the type of reaction you're looking at. Um, your concentrations of your A and B uh, will be to some power. This power is known as the order, um, and these orders are determined experimentally. So we actually have to have real uh, data to be able to analyze M and N. Okay, and if you combine all of these components, you will get what is known as a rate law. So let's now, if we're going to look at a specific example of a rate law, we're going to look at this reaction here. Now, remember when we're writing the rate law expressions, we ignore our products. Okay, <clears throat> and of course, we're going to have the several components that we discussed in the last slide. Okay, so we're going to have our rate constant times the concentration of our. Um, reactant to some power, okay, our order. Now, um, I want to make sure that I am expressing or, or uh, emphasizing that n is experimentally determined, okay? n is not derived from coefficients or anything of that sort, um, so make sure that you are uh, not accidentally plugging in those exponential values, okay? So n has to be established experimentally. So rate of this reaction here is going to be equal to K times the concentration of our reactant NO2 to some power of N.
Okay, so let's go ahead and let's determine the form of our rate law, um, specifically looking at our exponents. Okay, so remember we talked about m and n being um, the order of the reaction. Okay, so what you need to understand about the exponent is that they dictate the overall reaction order. Okay, and we're going to talk about how that affects the rate specifically, but before we move into that, let's talk about the vocabulary. Okay, so if I have an exponent of m equals 1 for this rate law here, what that means is that we would say that the reaction rate, okay, or the reaction is first order with respect to a. Okay, if our exponent n is equal to 1, we would say that the reaction is first order with respect to b. Okay, now the reaction order overall is going to be the sum of those exponents. So in this case, 1 plus 1 gives us 2. Okay, so that would be second order overall. Okay, so why does this even matter? Why do we even care? So the reality of it is, is that the order of the reaction help us uh, establish specific um, ways in which a reactant affects the rate of that specific reaction process. So your exponents are going to show how the rate is affected by the concentration of each of the individual reactants. Okay, so if I take this rate law here, okay, and let's say that I find out that my m value is equal to 1. Okay, so what that means is this is what my rate law would look like. So what this means is whatever concentration for a I plug in, that's going to be the rate that I get. Okay, so if I start with a concentration of 1, okay, I will have a specific rate. If I double that concentration, right, my reaction rate is going to be doubled. If I triple it, it's going to be tripled, etc. It's kind of a direct relationship that, in that respect. Now, if I take that same um, generic rate law that we see here, okay, and I figure out experimentally that my order or my m value is 2, Okay, well, when I go ahead and I come back here and I plug in my concentration values, what I'm going to see is that whatever value I start with, right, if I change the concentration, I'm not going to get a doubling anymore. At that point, I'm going to get a quadrupling. So if I look at this, if I start with a rate, uh, excuse me, a concentration of A equal to 1, okay, I'm going to have a specific rate uh, value. If I double it, Right? If I double that concentration, my reaction rate is going to quadruple. Okay? So basically, this exponent is going to indicate how the concentration of the reactant is going to affect, affect the overall rate um, of the reaction. Okay? So obviously, the exponents are pretty important in terms of um, figuring out you know, what, what's going to affect the rate most drastically. Okay, so I'm wanting to establish the uh, rate law associated with this reaction here. Okay, so um, I'm going to first write out a generic rate law, okay, and basically look at the things I need to establish, okay, and obviously the thing I need to establish here is my order of the reaction with respect to the N205. So what we're going to do is basically set up an experiment that allows us to um, monitor the reaction progression of our specific reaction reactants disappearance um, versus time. Okay, so we're going to collect this data. We'll use uh, spectroscopy methods, um, analyze or, or compile that data, and then graph it um, in the following manner. So basically we're going to have our y-axis with our concentration of our reactant and time in seconds or minutes or what have you um, on our x-axis. Okay, so then what we'll do is once we uh, establish our graph, we're then going to select a point on the graph. We're going to um, get the corresponding concentration and figure out the instantaneous rate um, using the prescribed procedures we discussed uh, before. Um, so we're going to start with a early on um, time frame uh, and concentration. Then we're going to find out uh, approximately where that concentration um, has decreased to about half. Okay, and we're going to establish the instantaneous rate at that point. Okay, and then we're going to compare the two rates um, associated with uh, the decreasing of our concentration by half. Okay, so in this case, we've gone from 5.4 times 10 to the negative fourth um, molarity per second as our rate um, to 
uh, 2.7 times 10 to the negative 4 molarity per second. Okay, so in this case, what we observe here is that when we have our con concentration, we also have our reaction rate. So what we're observing here is that there is a direct relationship between the concentration of our reactant and the rate of our reaction. Okay, so because of that, we know that the exponential value associated with um, our rate law is going to be equal to 1. And we know this because if we have our concentration, we have our rate. In that same way, if I doubled my concentration, I should double my rate. Okay, so my rate law is going to go from being generic into this specific rate law. That is first order overall, because there's only one reactant. Um, and because there's only one reactant, we say that it's first order with respect to the N205. Okay, so this is an inspection method. It's not the easiest method, but it is an option that you can use. Okay, so one more thing I want to point out on this um, slide is that the rate law that we have ex established here experimentally is first order um, with respect to the N205. Now I want you guys to notice that the coefficient here in front of N205 is 2. Okay, now guys, listen, we do not use coefficients to establish our orders of our reaction that must be used or established experimentally. Okay, so guys, please make sure that you are never using the coefficients in front of an equation to give me my orders for a specific reaction. So we're gonna go ahead and look at a different method for establishing the rate law for a specific reaction. Okay, um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the method of initial rates. And what I mean by initial rate is that that's the instantaneous rate um, just slightly after the start of the reaction. Okay, so this is really before the initial concentration of the reactants has changed significantly. Um, and so there hasn't been a, a large buildup of products that can lead to, you know, the reversible reaction and what have you. So basically these are the analysis, or this is the analysis of the rates just after the reaction started. Okay, so what I'll end up doing is I'm going to obviously write my generic rate law for my pro reaction progression. Okay, so I've written that here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the established data um, from the, initial met the method of initial rates to establish my exponential orders. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and look at that process. We're going to go ahead and we are going to analyze this reaction. I have some data here um, that I'm going to obviously use for this reaction progression. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I want to analyze um, my uh, general rate law here. Okay, I have my reactants, um, I have my exponential values, and I have my K. Okay, so what I'm going to want to do, guys, is I'm going to want to find um, from my experimental data, data that has uh, concentrations that don't change with respect to one variable. Okay, so in this case, uh, experiments one and two are going to be the ones that um, I'm going to uh, be comparing. So what I'm going to do is I am going to plug in my data associated with experiment 1 and experiment 2 in the following manner. Okay, so basically guys, what you can see here is that I'm comparing um, experiment 2's data with respect to the rate law versus experiment 1. So I'm going to actually plug in the numbers I have here with respect to my concentrations of each and my initial rates. So now that we've gone ahead and plugged in the values um, into each of our rate laws for the ex associated with each experimental data set, we're going to go ahead and look at what we can cancel out. Okay, so if we look at this, um, our constants K should cancel, um, our concentrations associated with our um, NH4 plus ion can cancel, and we are left with um, these two sets of data. Okay, so if we go ahead and we do the math associated with these, Okay, so 0 .1, 0 0.010 divided by 0 0.05 is going to give us um, 2m, okay, and 2.70 times 10 to the negative 7th um, divided by 1.35 times 10 to the negative 7th is going to give us 2. Okay, so 2 to what power of m is going to give us 2? Okay, so in this context, we realize that m is going to be equal to 1. So I have found the first um, power or first order um, associated with my NO2 minus ion. Okay, so now that we have figured out the order of the reaction associated with NO2 minus, we need to do the same process but with different data for our NH4 plus ion. So in this context, we need to find um, a data set that is constant with respect to the NO2 ion, which is going to be 3 and 2 respectively. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and plug those and set that up. 
Okay, so now that we've plugged all those in, we're gonna go ahead and figure out um, what variables cancel. Okay, so obviously K and K. Okay, the fact that our concentrations associated with NO2 minus are the same, um, as well as my exponents will be the same, will cancel out. Okay, and so that leaves us with um, our concentration of our um, NH4 plus relative to the rates for uh, reaction or experimental procedures one and two. Okay, so in this context, guys, uh, 0.2 divided by 0.1 is going to give us 2 to some power. Okay, and um, our rates divided by one another are also equal to 2. So in this context, our n is equal to 1. Okay, because 2 to what power equals 2? Of course, it's going to be 1. So in this context, guys, we have found that our um, n value is going to be 1. Okay, so our overall rate expression... Uh, our rate law, excuse me, is going to be as follows um, for the reaction that we see above. Okay, so what we would say for this reaction um, is that it is going to be second order overall, okay, because the sum of the exponential values um, associated with the rate law is going to be equal to 2. Okay, so it's second order overall. Okay, and it's going to be first order with respect to um, NH4 plus and first order with respect to NO2 minus. Okay, and so that's what we would say um, for this reaction progression here. Okay, so we talked about the overall reaction order for the previous example um, that we just looked at or just calculated, um, and we established that the reaction order overall is 2. Um, now, we're going to use the rate law to allow us to calculate our rate constant, okay? So basically what we can do is we can select any of the data sets um, and plug them into our rate law, okay? So what we're going to do here is we're going to take experimental data 1 and we are going to plug them into the rate law that we see here, okay? Now, remember, these, are, um, these values that we've plugged in here are molarities, okay? Um, and the rate here uh, that... Um, I've been given as my method or my initial rate is molarity per second. Okay, um, so those units are going to be important, um, especially when we deal with uh, rate laws that have um, exponential values that are um, something other than 1. Okay, so in this case, um, because I have an exponential value here of 1, um, my units here will just stay molarity. Um, if this was a 2, then the units here would be molarity squared. If this was a 3, molarity cubed, etc., etc. And also, when we multiply these two units, obviously our exponential values, our molarity times our molarity, will become molarity squared. Okay, so that's going to give us um, a relationship between the units um, as follows. Okay, so you guys can see these relationships here. Basically, um, we have taken our uh, units alone. We have our uh, rate constant and that we're going to be solving for. Okay, so when uh, we multiply these together, we're going to end up with molarity squared times our rate constant is equal to the units of our rate itself. Now, when we solve for k all by itself, we get molarity divided by molarity squared per second. Okay, and if we go ahead and we cancel out the units that are able to be canceled, we're going to end up with a unit set that equals 1 divided by m over s, which another way to write that um, is basically by putting the minus signs above the molarity and the seconds, uh, which indicates that it's um, the inverse um, of molarity and seconds respectively. Okay, so um, this is how you'd go about calculating your rate constant um, and the rate constant units. Guys, please, again, make sure that you're paying attention to the fact that if you have anything other than 1 over here, um, your units here will be squared or cubed respectively, um, and obviously that will affect your units of your um, rate constant. Okay, now, some of you may be wondering, you know, hey, what constitutes... Um, The reaction is going to be relatively fast or slow. Okay, so um, values that are you know ten to the nine or greater are typically considered really fast reactions, while those um, that are you know ten to the one or or smaller are going to be relatively slow uh, reactions. Um, although you're not usually going to be requested to differentiate between either of those. So um, just so you have that as a general idea, though, in your head.